All right, I, I, uh, I make that 9.30, so we might make a start um, for this month's uh, Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. I would like to introduce Sam North, and Sam's a research hydrologist with New South Wales DPI at our Denilicon Research Advisory Station. His special interests lie in ways of improving the agronomic, hydraulic and operational performance of irrigation systems, mainly in rice farming systems. Now between 2010 and 2014, Sam led, a re led research into the salinity tolerance of Australian rice cultivars. Um, that, and that's been used to update crop and water management guidelines for groundwater irrigated rice in the Riverina. Um, and that part, that work was part of a larger ACR funded project looking to improve rice establishment and productivity in Australia and Cambodia. Sam's also determined benchmarks for profitable use of centre pivot and linear move irrigation systems and developed management guidelines for the sustainable use of saline sadic groundwater for irrigation. And so he's the right person uh, to speak today on this subject, particularly where we have an issue with water scarcity in New South Wales. So I am going to give uh, Sam the presentation rights. Um, morning, everyone. This is uh, there's a bit of technical stuff in this talk, and so I'm hoping I've made it generic enough for um, users to understand, but in order to make sure and we're all covering off on the same sort of points, I think I, up front I need to talk about a few key terms. Um, so this talk is about salinity and how to manage soil sedicity. There is one measure of um, salinity as TDS, total dissolved solids. Salts, uh, they dissociate or they separate into a positive and a negative ion in water because they're soluble. Um, and so normally this would be measured, you'd send off water, they'd evaporate it and then they get a, a weight. Um, and so that's your TDS. Because the amount of salt in water is proportional, you know, it's dissociated, it, it's, um, it can conduct an electric current. And so we can actually measure the amount of salt in water by measuring the current that we can pass through it. So that's the electrical conductivity. And EC or electrical conductivity is proportional to the amount of salt in it, TDS. And that's that little formula there, EC equals approximately total dissolved solids divided by 640. So when you get your water test, if you've got a TDS on it, you can convert it to an EC or parts per million. And if you've got an EC, you can convert it to parts per million. Now the other little bit of confusing bit in that is that there are different uh, electrical conductivity ratios and you might see an EC with a little SE next to it and the SE stands for saturated extract and that's done on a soil sample um, and it's had water added to it so that it's saturated and puddled but there's no free water in it and then that's either centrifuged or filtered and they take the extract of water out and that's got the salt in it, and they measure an EC of that saturated extract. The more normal one you would see from your soil tests is that EC, one to five, and that's a, an extract done on a ratio of one part of soil to five parts of water. And the other one, I guess I'm using in here, and you might see written every now and then is EC, IW, uh, which is irrigation water, ICW, which is water. And that's simply a straight measure of the water, you know, like your groundwater as it might come out of the bore. Now the other thing we're talking about today is sedicity and there are two measures of sedicity. SAR stands for sodium absorption ratio and it's a measure on the water. So the salt or sodium in the water is ratio of sodium to um, potassium and magnesium. And ESP, is, or sorry calcium and magnesium, I'll get that right. And ESP is, stands for exchangeable sodium percent and that relates to the solid fraction. That's the amount of sodium that's held on the exchange sites on the clays. A little bit technical, but just bear in mind, the thing you need to remember is that SAR relates to a measure in water and ESP relates to a measure of the soil. And the other thing just to cover off on leaching fraction and quite simply, that's the amount of water. You put a megalitre of water on your paddock, 100 millimetres, and 10 millimetres of that will drain for example, we'll drain past the bottom of the root zone 
And so 10 on 100 is 0.1 or 10%, and that's what your leaching fraction is. And we need to have a leaching fraction so that we don't get salts building up in the soil. Um, <clears throat> the reason why we don't want salts building up is because groundwater contains a lot of salt. So if you've got one, for you know, the example I've got up there on that slide, one and a half deci semen groundwater, GW, um, if you put three megs onto a wheat crop over a winter period, you're going to add three tonnes of salt. And then if you do that year in and year out, you're going to quickly end up with a lot of salt in your profile and you need to leach that. So it needs to go out of the bottom of the profile and that's why you need a um, leaching fraction. Where sodium comes in is that it can, um, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on, um, it, it can affect your soil to the point where it disperses and it blocks all the soil pores. And when that happens, the soil can no longer be leached. And so you have a, a double problem. You, you, you can't leach it because it's dispersed. And so you end up with all sorts of difficulties and um, salt going to production and limiting lessons. Now, Normally, when we talk about groundwater management, historically, I suppose, or traditionally, it's been a prescriptive approach. And you get information like this. Now, this is from our DPI's prime fact, and there's a table in it, and we'll have um, plant type, and you'll have a, a root zone salinity. So that's not the water salinity, that's the salinity in the soil at which you start to get a percentage decline in production. And so if you think, oh, I'm going to go cotton, and if you have a look at your slide, your table there, your cotton, 10% um, root zone salinity, uh, two and a half deci semens. And depending on the texture of your soil, how well drained it is, you're going to get a, a certain leaching fraction. And then that will depend, that will give you an idea of how, what your threshold or limit, upper limit, but for irrigation water, salinity should be. So if you've got a well-drained soil, you could put on 3.3 deci semens, it would leach a lot of that salt out. And so you could grow your maize at, and you wouldn't uh, go over your two and a half deci semens per metre. If it's less water out the bottom, so moderate to slow draining, you can see that figure there, um, 1.65 deci semens, very slow draining, you're going to accumulate salts and really you don't want to go over 0.83 deci semens. But the problem with this is that it's prescriptive and long term um, within that formula, so to speak, there's no, there's management of salinity but there's no management of sedicity. And so you might go along quite happily irrigating and there'll be a change of season or you'll put fresh water on again or something will happen. You might change crop type and things don't work out so well. You know, like that soil might collapse, it disperses and then you, the, um, the problem is that what you do with it. And there are examples that I've seen where paddocks basically have become non-productive. It's good that information if you're in a development phase and you want to know the quality of your water and what sort of crops you can grow, but it doesn't inform long-term use and management, particularly of soil sedicity. <clears throat> the approach I'm advocating in this, and I'll give you some evidence um, as to how, how and why this might work, is to do what you would normally do in a farming situation and supply active and adaptive management. So you need to put in place some monitoring with some benchmarks and some trigger points. Um, and as those, as you do that monitoring, you, you're running through this plan, do, check, act cycle. So first off, assess your water, have a look at what crop you wanna grow, you irrigate, you apply gypsum, and then you monitor your soil and your water, particularly your soil you see whether you reached any of your trigger points. So root zone salt, you don't want it over a certain limit and you have a look at your an assessment of your leaching fraction. Have you exceeded these limits? Yes, then you need to change something. If you haven't, then you can keep going. Plan, do, check, act. Now this, this is a, I put this caution up there because this is a generalized discussion. And the information I'm presenting comes from my experience and those of my colleagues here in southern New South Wales and northern Victoria um, on the Riverine Plains. And so we're really dealing with sodium chloride dominant groundwater. 
we are predominantly surface irrigated systems and we have winter dominant rainfall. And looking at the list of people who are attending this, we've got people from everywhere nationally. So that red bit of type on the bottom of the script, seek specialist advice, particularly if it's relevant, you know, to make it relevant to your situation. And, and I'm talking mainly about managing sodium chloride, but there are other things in these waters. And so go and get a water test and make sure and see what you've got in your samples. Why do we need to manage salinity and sodicity? Uh, salinity affects plant growth, sodicity affects soil aggregate stability and therefore your ability to leach it. The effect of salinity is mainly through what's called an osmotic effect. This makes the water harder, you know, the more salt in the soil makes the, the water harder for the plant to extract from the soil, it reduces transpiration and growth and so therefore you get a decline in, in yield. You may in some instances if you build up um, levels of certain salts uh, to toxic levels or there might be nutritional disorders. Sodicity affects infiltration and hydraulic conductivity. If you can't get water into the soil, you can't get water to the plant. Um, yeah, people may have seen them, I guess the phrase is a Sunday soil, you know, like it's too wet one day and too dry the next. Um, you can't leach those soils either and if you can't leach them well then you're going to accumulate salts and that's kind of to production limiting levels. So salinity can only be managed when you manage sodicity and so this is again a point of difference between those standard advices where they're mainly about salinity and this talk is to give you some confidence that you can do this long term if you manage your sodicity. Now I need to cover off on a little bit of technical stuff. This is work Quirk and Schofield back in 1995 and they derived the concept of what was called the threshold electrolyte concentration. And you see on this graph on the bottom axis, you've got electrical conductivity and on the vertical axis, the sodium content of the waters that is being measured, sodium absorption ratio. As you increase the salinity of your water, that water is able to contain more sodium and the soil and still have the soil remain in a flocculated condition. Problems come when you reduce the salinity of the water, so you move back to the left, but you don't also reduce the sodicity of the water. And if you do that, then the soil becomes dispersed. Um, I won't go into the technical reasons for that, but basically the problem is not when you move to high salinity water, problems occur when you move from high salinity situations back to low. Um, now this table <coughs> here is out of, uh, and you see the reference on the bottom, the ANZAC Water Quality Guidelines for Australia. That blue line is that line that separated the flocculated to the dispersed and um, you can see that uh, the Queenslanders, Roger Shaw and Ian Gordon have done another line in there and they've got uh, the dashed line where you've got a little bit of um, uncertainty maybe over what's flocculated and what's dispersed. But pretty much the Australian guidelines on water quality have taken that line from Quirk and Schofield in 1955. Now the, the problem with that this is work from John Bennett and Steve Rain, and there's six soil types in there and all of those lines delineate in the bottom right hand corner, flocculated soil moving up to the top left hand corner where it might be dispersed and you can see that, that none of them actually fit with that line of Quirk and Schofield. And so there isn't really a universal um, <clears throat> descriptor of what constitutes uh, dispersed and a flocculated soil and it's another reason why these prescriptive uh, advice as you see off of you know, your ANZEC guidelines for instance don't work. Each paddock will be different, it will be unique to the water that you put on it and the crop that you grow in it and the management you put on it. And for that reason, again, come back, we need to have this adaptive management approach. 
Now, there's strong evidence out there um, over a long period of time that we can sustainably manage groundwater, sail on sodic groundwater. There are four, two main principles, I guess, they are the first two. We need to leach salts, particularly chloride and sodium. And um, we also need to displace the sodium with the use of gypsum. There is consequences from changing from um, high EC or poor quality water down to low quality water. And because we need to leach, we need fresh water. Not everyone with a groundwater pump has access to fresh river or channel water supplies. And so in that instance, we need to really look at the use of rainfall for leaching and that is possible, but it needs to be factored into some of our management decisions. So I'll go through those four points. And um, first up, there's three longer term trials. The first one that Thompson, Hume and Slavich, that was uh, rice wheat, two years of pasture rotation here at Daniloquin. And that was run over two rotations, um, eight years on a I've called it red soda soil. So it's a duplex or loam over a sodic B horizon. Um, that second one there, I'm not really going to talk about, but that link there is worth going to. It's a rather intensive system. It was done for Griffith Council by Nihal and John Blackwell and Tapas Biswas. And it showed that in an intensively managed situation, you could successively reuse drainage water. So you put groundwater onto a paddock, take the more concentrated tar water off the bottom end of that paddock and apply it to another paddock and you could get good productivity until you almost got brine. So it, it's a good example of how you can intensively manage groundwater to be sustainable and, and successful and be productive. As I say, I'm not going to talk about it. I suggest you go and have a look at that publication, it's still on the web. Um, Matt Bethune and Terry Beatty, uh, 10 years of irrigation with saline water. They had uh, two and a half deci semen and four and a half deci semen at quite high sodium ratios. Um, it was a lighter soil type, non sodic in the subsoil, and it was on perennial pasture, and that pasture was left undisturbed. And so, those three examples, they give us a good, good instance or um, that we can actually do this sustainably and there's a few lessons that we can take away from those trials. This first one here is the one at Daniloquin um, and you see the graph on the left is electrical conductivity on the vertical axis and date on the bottom. The right graph is your sodium absorption ratio um, of your soil water and you can see the rotation wheat, pasture and rice. And there was three treatments of control with only, that's fresh channel water, 0.15 deci semens. A low salinity water where three deci semens was put on the wheat crop. That was in, would have been in spring. And two deci semen water was put on subclover. <clears throat> and there was a high salinity treatment where four and a half deci semens was put on the wheat and three deci semens on the subclover. And then a rice crop was grown on fresh water to leach the salts out of the profile and see what would happen with those salts. If we look at electrical conductivity, you see we can see here at the start of the um, trial period, we put salty water on the wheat and we get salt increases and it increases more in the high salinity treatment than it does in the low salinity treatment. There's some winter leaching under the pasture and a bit of a rise as we come into the rice, but then we grow a rice crop and our soil profile, this is from 0 to 90 centimetres. Um, our soil salinity is the same at the end after one rice crop as it was at the beginning of the treatment period. Now it's, it's a similar pattern with the sodium in the graph on the right. It increases through the treatment period where you're putting groundwater on and it declines with the rice crop. So we do get some leaching of sodium under the rice, but we don't leach all the sodium. And so our, our sodium levels at the end of the rice crop haven't gone back to where they were at the beginning of the experiment. <clears throat> uh, so that 
message one number one we can leach chlorides quite easily sodium is stickier if you want to call it that and so we need to be more careful about managing sodium um, and we're not going to just leach it with um, with uh, fresh water how many rice crops would it take um, to leach that sodium with fresh water and again here a little bit more of a complicated graph but again we've got electrical conductivity um, on the horizontal axis we've got depth down the profile on the vertical axis we've got as I say, electrical conductivity in these graphs on the left and we've got uh, sodium absorption ratio you know, so soil water EC the soil, soil water sodium I should say on the right after one rice crop you know we've got our control uh, not that much salt uh, and we've salinized, we've got starting with a salinized profile. Uh, we're not back. Two rice crops, we see, we see we've shifted the salt to the left, uh, less salty. After three rice crops, we're pretty much back to a similar sort of level of salt in the profile as we had before we put the groundwater on. Four rice crops, again, no difference. And we see on the right with the sodium, even with four rice crops, we're still not back to sodium levels that we were as at the start of the treatment. So even with a lot of leaching and you could be putting on, you know, like 14 megalitres a hectare over summer, so well, five, so that's 600 millimetres pretty much over four seasons, for instance, on four rice crops. It's a lot of fresh water and we still haven't shifted all the sodium out of that profile. We've got rid of the salt, but we haven't got rid of all the sodium. And when you think back to that, Quirk and Schofield diagram. The, the issue there is that you will have moved the salinity to the left, but you haven't shifted the, the sedicity horizontally vertically down to the same extent, and so you push that soil more into a dispersive situation. <clears throat> what about different irrigation strategies? Now we've gone from rice, and this is a loosened crop on a similar sort of soil. It's a non sodic so it's 10 or 15 centimetres of loam over a um, heavy clay B. We're growing loose and for three years this loosened crop was irrigated alternating highly saline groundwater at six deci siemens at an SAR of 16. So it had a groundwater irrigation, six deci siemens and the next irrigation it got channel water. Um, and Alternating those water supplies did not affect infiltration. Infiltration being a measure of how stable that soil was. You see here on the graph, you know, electrical conductivity, so our salt and our depth down here, we've got our groundwater treated and we've got our freshwater control. We had an accumulation of salt in the groundwater treated treatment. <clears throat> with a bulge here, we had a high water table under this, so very little leaching, which is why we had an accumulation of salt under both the groundwater and the freshwater treated. So we have a salinized profile after three years in both instances. After that, we mixed things up again and we, we leached for two years with fresh water. So two summers of fresh water at two different irrigation strategy 60 millimetres 120 and 180 millimetres and as you'd expect the more water you put on 60 millimetre irrigation deficit we leach more salt but the interesting thing was that the 180 which is the, which, sorry the 120 which is the green here didn't get leached as much as the 180 millimetre deficit and this will be due to cracking so we get a greater drying um, in the profile with 180 millimetre deficit and as a result, we're able to get more water to pass through with those irrigations and we're able to more effectively leach the crop. So we can use more episodic irrigation to more effectively leach and make better use of a limited amount of water to actually leach these salts. Um, the other point there I've got in blue is that the season average applied water salinity, that can be used to estimate the effect on soils and plants. And that, that has consequences when you come to thinking about management because season average water, yeah, you've got rainwater, you may have fresh river or channel water, and you've got groundwater. You can sum and average those for the season 
and that gives you an indication of your total salt load on that soil. This is um, <clears throat> Terry Beatty and um, Matt Bethune's work. So this is perennial pasture, 10 years irrigated with um, two and a half and four and a half deci semen irrigation water. So similarly, we've got graphs on the left, which are related to salinity and graphs on the right, ESP, so it's the soil sedicity. And we can see here, there's a couple of key points that I want to point out. The more salt you put on, so the four and a half deci semen, the more salty the soil gets, but it rises to a point and then it evens out. It gets to a stable um, condition. And this is a tatura. And so you've got through the 90s, you had good winter rainfall. And so you increase your salinity through the summer and then you have winter leaching where you're getting some reduction in salinity. And that's not occurring at the cost of infiltration. So you're not getting a loss in soil structure. And the reason for that is you've got an intact perennial pasture sward. Um, now, the, over here on the right, so this is a, the topsoil and you've got your subsoil. You don't get as much leaching in the subsoil um, of the salts. And then if you look over on the right at your sodium, you see similar sort of patterns for sodium in the topsoil. But if you look at these ESPs, you know, we're getting ESPs of 35, um, 30, 35, 40. So it's, it's, these soils are highly sodic or become highly sodified. Um, what Terry and uh, Matt did was at the end of that 10 year period of irrigation with groundwater, they then gave it two seasons of irrigation with fresh water. And you can see on the left and the top, we've had some loss of salts, uh, some leaching of salts with that fresh water. Again, if you look at the bottom graph, we haven't shifted the sodium anywhere near as much and certainly not in the subsoil. So the consequence of changing to that lower quality water was that they did get a reduction in infiltration. So this is what they call standardized infiltration. So it's the two treatments, the high and the low salinity water, high and the low in the triangles. Um, and you can see infiltration was higher um, while they were putting the salt water on than it was with fresh water, which was their control. But once they shifted to and stopped groundwater irrigation and shifted those treatments onto those salinized and sodified sites, that they did get a reduction in um, infiltration rate here. And that is potentially when you could end up with some problems. Um, but it wasn't significant and it wasn't significant. Well, it was, it was a significant difference, but it wasn't enough to reduce productivity. Uh, what they didn't report, but what I do know they did was at the end of that trial, they then renovated that pasture. And when they renovated, the um, infiltration rate went to near zero. So it, the key take home point on this is that having that pasture sward intact, that organic matter, that root growth in the soil, that allowed that soil to handle those really high ESPs, 35 to 40, and still be quite productive and still maintain a leaching fraction. So yes, gypsum is important, but also not cultivating and keeping root mats intact and pasture is a wonderful thing for um, sodic soils. I'll put this one back up here. This is that same graph. It's really there as a placeholder to remind me. The reason why we got leaching on this lucerne, um, this was a deniloquin, three years of groundwater, highly sodified profile, two years of fresh water. It, we still had leaching and good leaching and it's the same thing. It was lucerne. We didn't get in there. We didn't cultivate it. Um, so the stand was intact. We didn't add energy to that soil to then help it to puddle and disperse. And the other key factor in there that these, both these two soils are loam topsoils. So they're less prone to dispersion because they haven't got such a high clay content. So two things to bear in mind. How effective is gypsum? This work started back in the 60s uh, here in the Riverina, Brian Bridge. 
The problem they had was pasture establishment on highly sodic soils, ESP there of 23. And they'd run fresh irrigation, fresh river water with an EC of you know, only 0.1 deci siemens, and these soils would immediately disperse and they couldn't get establishment of pasture through the 50s and 60s when they brought irrigation in. Their solution was to water run gypsum, and they, by water running gypsum, because it's partially soluble, they're able to raise the electrical conductivity of that irrigation water to one deci semen, and that pushed it to the left in that Quirk and Schofield flocculation dispersion diagram, and it flocculated, kept the soil flocculated, and so it allowed the water to go in, it allowed the pasture to establish without forming a crust. Now, one of the other advantages of this is that it was a far more efficient use of gypsum, adding it to this fresh water. So with a 75 millimetre irrigation application, they were only putting on 0.6 of a tonne per hectare and getting good pasture establishment compared to where previously they were having to spread two or three tonnes to get the same effect. So water running gypsum is a very effective way of shifting your water quality within that uh, Quirk Schofield diagram, but it will depend on your water quality. So um, just be aware of that. The next bit of work um, was a Tatura, that's Mahenny and Bleestyle. They applied gypsum in a high water table situation, again to a nice loam, um, red uh, duplex soil, ESP of only 8.3, but had been irrigated with 7.8 deci semen water. And they found that gypsum was only effective when water tables were controlled. So as a key take home point here, if you've got high water tables, you won't be able to leach soils, even if you put gypsum on, because that water table is stopping um, water flowing through the soil. Gypsum was highly effective. They decreased ESP from 8.3 down to 3.7. Hydraulic conductivity went from 1.12 centimetres a day up to 24 centimetres a day, 40% increase in um, infiltration. They had increased chloride leaching and they increased their yields by 30 to 40%. And I put a little note in there for me more than anyone else possibly, but ripping was ineffective, whether it was done with gypsum or um, on its own. Um, and there'd be various reasons for that, but I guess my take home point for you guys is that the key thing is gypsum. Um, don't worry about other things, just get that gypsum on and put the calcium on to displace the sodium. That last little point there, no effect of gypsum if the irrigation water electrical conductivity is greater than that TEC is the threshold electrolyte concentration. It's the same sort of point that Bridge was making. <clears throat> If your water's salty enough or quite salty for the sodium levels that you've got, putting gypsum on is not, not going to make any difference. It's when you go from salty water back to fresh water, um, where that's where gypsum becomes effective. So you reduce the salinity of your water, but you, you haven't necessarily reduced the sodicity of the situation so much. So you put gypsum on to get that electrolyte effect um, and keep everything flocculated and on the right-hand side of that Quirk Schofield diagram. Um, Peter Slavich and John Thompson back in the early 90s looked at, uh, these are all rice soils, three vertisols and two sodasols, so uniform grey clays and two transitional red soils. They found similarly to their other work that rice was leached, uh, rice leached the chloride beyond 90 centimetres, but by putting gypsum on 12 to 18 months before they pondered for rice and incorporating that gypsum. The gypsum significantly increased chloride leaching under the rice and gypsum also enhanced the reduction of sodicity. So putting that gypsum on prior to freshwater events or a leaching event will facilitate leaching of salts and it will also help you shift the sodium that's in the profile. It needs to be in the surface before the event um, that other point there will make sense later on. Leaching fractions need to be at least 0.1 for a salt balance. Uh, if your irrigation water EC is 0.75 to 1.1. Now, 1.1 deci seems not particularly salty, 
it's saline water but the the take-home message there is that it's your average salinity over the season that makes the difference so you might have 1.8 deci seam in water and you might have 450 mils of fresh rainfall and when you combine the two you get your average ec that's going onto that soil we'll talk about that a bit later um, and again, that point about water tables, you can't leach um, when there's a shallow water table. Uh, so they, they observe better leaching with a deep water table compared to a shallow. Uh, this one is the results from that experiment and there's a, a grey vertisol on the left and a red sodasol in the graph on the right. And you can see a zero gypsum rate and you've got, we're going with depths, you've got quite high chloride, this is chloride, not electrical conductivity, but chloride's a good indicator of salinity. And you see that as you increase the gypsum rate from two and a half to five tonnes with one rice crop, you get more leaching and you come down here. And so we've lost some salt there, a fair bit of salt, um, or chloride certainly. Um, in the soda soil, it's a leakier soil. And so before rice, we've got a um, significant amount of salt below a metre. We, even with just a rice crop, we've lost some of that chloride, but when we put two and a half and five tonnes on, we lose even more down to two metres. Um, so we get greater leaching with lighter soils and with higher gypsum rates. But you can see that the gypsum is actually quite effective in helping to shift salts. So it's, it's an asset and an aid. Rainfall. How good is it? This was work done by uh, Ian Hume, Peter Millthorpe, also back in the 90s, out at Hilston and Walpi up. So we're talking about a Mallee semi-arid environment. I can't for the life of me remember how much rainfall these places get. Hilston's in western New South Wales and Walpi up's in northwestern Victoria. Uh, these are modelled results, but you can see the year down the bottom. So they modelled it from 1957 through to nearly 1990. Uh, and with different rotations, so you've got a loosened rotation and a medic rotation, the loosens in the black square um, at Hillston, and then they had a rotation with out fallow, and they had a rotation with fallow at Walpi up. And you can see, as you'd expect, that um, with greater water use, you get fewer um, recharge events. So this is recharged below the root zone, but even with a deep rooted crop like Lucen, over that period you do get significant periods where you get deep drainage and so even in these semi-arid environments you do have opportunities um, where you get excess rainfall and you have leaching. Uh, you can see that um, there's more with a medic rotation, the medic's not using as much water uh, or with a the fallow there's more opportunity to leach. I'm not advocating fallow for groundwater users, but uh, you can see that opportunities exist. How does that relate to the real world? This is data from just to the west of Daniloquin. CSIRO sampled the soils in these districts back in 1947. They measured chloride and sodium. We went through in 2007, refound some of these sites and resampled them. And you can see we had a mix of irrigated and dryland sites paired. Um, the graph on the left, we have chloride, we have down the profile. 1947, they are relatively highly saline sites. At over that 70 year period, with just rainfall, we've had a significant amount of leaching since the 1940s. And with irrigation, we've even lost a little bit more chloride. The difficulty has come because we haven't really, you can see on the graph on the right, we haven't really shifted sodium. So there won't, these are freshwater or rainfall um, sites, so they won't have had gypsum programs. Um, if you were going to add gypsum to these sites, then I would expect that some of that sodium would have shifted. But the point behind this is that rainfall can be quite effective in shifting salts. You do need to keep adding um, the gypsum in order to shift the sodium. So summing up, uh, soil stability, uh, it's dependent on clay content and clay mineralogy, which you can't do anything about. What you do have control over is organic matter, your cultivation, and 
that combination between the electrical conductivity of the water you're putting on and the sodium in it, so the total salt load as well as the ratio of sodium to uh, calcium magnesium. You can use those things to your advantage in order to make groundwater irrigation sustainable. You can leach those salts with fresh water. I've got a note for myself there that this is best done with surface irrigation and that's because surface irrigation applies that leaching fraction. If you use precision irrigation systems like spray or drip then you're really relying on rainfall then so you, and you're more likely to end up with problems. So it's not that they can't be done but you need to be more aware of your management with spray and drip and drip particularly subsurface, I don't think I'd be advocating groundwater use at all and uh, for those systems, yeah, I guess I'm saying surface irrigation is best. Sodium and dispersion can be managed with gypsum, which we've seen. You can leach efficiently um, using winter rainfall, so apply your gypsum before winter rainfall will help you leach salts as well as displace sodium. And you can use episodic events, so you crack your soil and um, put your gypsum on and then wash it in. Uh, which is the second point, applying gypsum to dispersive soils before low EC water is applied. Don't put low water on and then go, oh I should have put gypsum on. It'll be too late. A couple of do's and don'ts. Uh, first one, apply a leaching fraction so you need to apply water, enough water so that you get drainage below the root zone, otherwise you get an accumulation of salts. If you've got high water tables, you can't do anything about managing your salts until you control those water tables. Conservation farming, that's around that cultivation, don't disturb your soils. And that last point there, matching irrigation intensity and the salt content of your groundwater with your access to fresh water. So if you haven't got access to fresh water and you're relying on just rainfall and you've got high EC water, then you really probably want to come back to just opportunistically irrigating the odd winter crop or even preferably pasture. If you've got access to fresh water for leaching, um, then that gives you greater opportunities for using higher salinity water and more intensively because you've got the ability to, to leach it. A couple of big do nots, um, don't shandy your groundwater with your fresh water and there's some technical reasons for that but the main reason is that you can reduce your conductivity by half but you'll only reduce your sodium, your SAR by 0.7. So you don't reduce your sodium to the same proportion as reduce your, your total salt load. So you get fresher water but it's, it's got a higher proportion of sodium in it and that's just the way the ratios work. So you can, by shanding your water, actually get a poorer quality water applied. Um, you're better off to alternate supplies or strategically use it, so fresh water to get a crop up and then when a crop gets a little bit tougher you can then use salt water and see if it goes for another sensitive period like flowering then you can come back to using the fresher water. So be strategic about how you use your water, don't shandy it. Don't cultivate dispersive soils and don't bear fallow. Now I've lost track of time a bit. I've got this relates to that PDF that you've got in your attachments. Um, and this is that adaptive management approach. Seven steps to this, and that is well described within that manual. We're talking about a monitoring program which involves testing your groundwater and your soil, having a look at what those results are, what your farm business structure is, how you set up, what crops you can grow with that water and with the um, overall EC and sodium regime that you've got. There's some simple soil testing and sample, sampling and testing that we can do to actually determine your leaching fraction and we can do a simple dispersion test in water that will give you an idea of how your soil is going to behave when the, the, with the quality of water that you're going to put on it and given that information you can then decide on your most appropriate management. 
This, these are all covered and I've got that in red there. So there's eight chapters in this book, um, in chapters six and seven, testing and monitoring and how you interpret your results. So I'm just going to spend 10 minutes and go through this very quickly. Um, but there is, as I say, there is more detail in that book. The two goals, if you haven't picked up on my main thread here, you need to manage the salinity in your root zone uh, so that it doesn't exceed or become too hot, too salty and you lose production. Uh, and you want to manage the sedicity of your soil so they remain flocculated. You don't want to end up with a paddock like those photos. Um, that's a dairy pasture supposedly. It, had nothing but groundwater with no management on it over a four year period and it turned it into just gloop and they lost. That's really weeds you can see in that photo on the, on the right. Um, but nothing's insoluble, nothing's um, irredeemable. I did see that paddock four years, uh, actually probably a bit longer, but after three years of good management when it changed hands, um, and I reckon it was probably one of the best subflavor pasture stands I'd ever seen in the district growing on that same block. After that, applied gypsum and leached the salts from it. So it can be done. Number one, assess your groundwater quality. Go, if you have a bore, you should have a little handheld EC meter. You should also have a full analysis done on that water as it comes straight from the bore after you've pumped it for a little bit and purged the well. Get a sample, send it off. I've talked about salinity and sedicity, but there are other things, bicarbonates, borons, arsenic, maybe even a few other things that you need to know what's in there. And so you need to send that water away for a full analysis. I'd do that initially once the bore's commissioned. Uh, I'd recommend doing it every three years. Um, it generally doesn't change, but you know, with droughts and the the changes in um, inflows and all of that sort of stuff, you, you do need to keep tabs on what's happening with your bore water. Um, you can get those test kits from local land service, send them off um, and get the results back. With your EC meter, you need to be checking regularly you need, at the start of the season, what's changed and then at least monthly so that you can pick up if there's been a spike or a reduction or in the, um, EC, the salinity, the EC of your water, keep notes. The next thing you need to do is uh, sample your soil. Again, like I'm, you see, I'm labouring this point, keep good records. Um, of the location, depth and date collected, you're looking for salinity, sedicity, pH, uh, dispersion in fresh water and also in the water that you're going to be irrigated with. And you'll get, um, when you set it away, you'll also get an ESP, exchangeable sodium percent on that soil sample. Keep supporting paddock information for your groundwater irrigated paddocks, how much rainfall and irrigation you put on um, and the conductivity of that water, what crops and yields when you put gypsum on, when you cultivate it, that sort of thing. The key thing here is to sample the same sites at the same time. You know, do you pick spring or autumn? You choose. It depends on your, how busy you are, I'm sure. But as long as you're consistent, um, I, it will depend on your farming operations and your rainfall regime. Select sites for sampling, you know, GPS them, pick sites that are representative of the bulk of the paddock, but then also have a look around. If, for instance, in a rice rotation or a rice bock, you're passing water from the top bay down to the bottom bay, you would also be sampling, particularly in the bottom bay, where you're going to have accumulation of salts. So in a border check layout, you might um, sample, for instance, at the head of the bay and at the bottom of the bay, um, anywhere where you've got reuse, anywhere where you've got heavier soil, um, where you can see problems might occur. 0 to 10 and 20 to 30 as sample depths is pretty standard. We also want to sample at the bottom of the root zone. If you go deeper than 60 to 70 centimetres, then by all means do so. You wouldn't really need to go past 90. 
but I think most commercial services will top out around about that 60 to 70 when they're doing their deep end tests. So if you sample at those depths, that'll allow you to do a number of calculations. Um, once you've got your results, you can calculate your average root zone salinity. You then look up what that root zone salinity and the crop tolerances are and see whether you're growing the right crop, need to change your crop rotation, or crop rotation or crop mix or shift to a pasture or something like that. With those numbers, you can also determine a leaching fraction. Now this, I've got drawing tools here. I'll see whether I can use these and see whether you can see see my mouse. Um, so 0 to 10, 20 to 30, 60 to 70 in the second column there in the top table. And you see you've textured it out, clay loam, light clay, heavy clay. That conversion factor relates to the texture and the conversion factor is needed because you've sent your soil away and you've got an EC from 1 to 5 for that soil sample and you need to convert it to estimate the saturated electrical conductivity, ECSE. So conversion factor of nine in the top row, EC 0.1, so we've got 0.9. Our three depths there, 0.9, 1.6, 2.4. And what we're after, oh, you see it in blue there, we've got an average root zone ECE. So we just use those three numbers and we get a rough average of the root zone saturated electrical conductivity of 1.6. We've, that's our soil data in the top table. In this bottom table, we've got our water data. We've, this farm's got three sources of water. They've got groundwater. MIL stands for Murray Irrigation Limited. So that's channel water from the irrigation delivery company. And we've got rainfall. This is all groundwater. He's using four megs and he gets 360 millimetres of rain in, on average in the year. And that's the EC of that water. If you multiply the depth by the conductivity, you get some numbers which you can then add down that column to get your B. So you're summing the total depth of water and you're summing the depth by the conductivity. You divide your depth by conductivity by the depth and you get an average salinity of the water that went on that paddock. And you can see there's 0.7. Six. So even though he's putting on 1.4 decisemen groundwater, because he's got 360 millimetres of rainfall, that's pretty much cutting that in half, so 0 0.76 decisemen. The other thing we're calculating here is we're using our numbers in that top table to estimate our leaching fraction. So we've got number two, which is 0.76. So that's our average salinity of the water applied. We're dividing it by the salinity of the water at the bottom of the root zone, which you can see there is 2.4, and a conversion factor of 2.2, and we work out that we've got a leaching fraction of 0.14. So we've got two numbers out of the information that we've collected from our soil and water sampling and our monitoring. We've got an average salinity of water that's going on that paddock. We've got a leaching fraction, and we've got an average salinity at, um, of the root zone, so three numbers there. They are the numbers we're going to use to make our management decisions. We've got our salinity of the root zone. Um, now this table, it's mainly right, but I think it's been updated and that's uh, one of your references in those DPI publications. You're using this orange column here, for instance, so we've got an average root zone salinity of 1.6. And so we really wouldn't be thinking of growing white clover or sub clover, possibly even not strawberry clover. We go for lucin, which can handle two deci salmons. Oats and wheat, five and six, not a problem there. Grain sorghum, 6.8, um, 5.5. So it's really only the sensitive clovers that we, and paspanum there, we might not grow and we're not going to use it really on horticultural crops with that average root zone salinity. Fourth bit of information we're after is what is the water that we're putting on? So we've got our groundwater and we take a soil sample. We put that soil sample 
into our groundwater and we see whether it disperses and we can use a simple little meter like the one shown in the photo on the right and to get an index of um, dispersibility of that soil with the water that we're putting on. You'll also have your exchangeable sodium percent from your soil test which is also another indicator but it's really the interaction between the water that we're applying or we plan to apply and that soil that we're interested in and that's why it's really good to do this on-farm test. Use the water that you're using and putting on your paddock with the soil that you're putting it on and see whether it disperses and if you're getting so the bottom the photo on the left, if you're getting a resaction like it's flocculated, you get no dispersion or even low, then you'll be pretty safe. If you're getting these medium and high dispersions with that water, then really you need to be having a bit of a think about your management, which is this rather confusing table here. This one, again, it's out straight out of the manual. And the easiest way to work this through is from the top left across um, and it's a decision tree pretty much. So if the average East root zone EC is less than the threshold value for your crop, so we had uh, through a root zone salinity of 1.6 dC semen and we're growing loosen, um, which has got a threshold value of 2 dC semen. So we're less than, we're in category one here. We had a leaching fraction of 0.14, so we're actually less than 0.15, only marginally, which will push us over here into category two. So we can say the soil salinity is non-limiting, but again, borderline, we've got low leaching and that may lead to salts building up in the soil. So as you can see, there's a potential for future salinization. It's not an issue at the moment because we haven't exceeded our threshold, 1.6 is less than 2. And we've looked at our dispersion um, depending on what you've got. If you've got no dispersion, you need to have a bit of a look around and find out what is causing um, that low leaching fraction and that might be a high water table as a for instance. <clears throat> it might be an impeded layer at depth but either way, you'll need to do some investigation. If the soil's dispersing, well, it's pretty clear that that's why you're not getting your um, leaching fraction. And so you'd be applying some gypsum to um, flocculate that soil, help it um, leach some salts. If you've exceeded your, if your root zone salinity has exceeded your threshold for your crop, um, but you're getting good leaching, you need to have a look at what's causing the high salinity in the first instance, but get water on there to leach that salt out or change to a more salt tolerant crop. Um, category four, it's in pink for a reason. Uh, it's not a good place to be. You're salty, your leaching fraction's low. Um, you really need to have a look at what's causing this, dispersing or not dispersing, um, apply gypsum leach. Seek advice. Um, that's one of the attachments that you've got. So you've got all those links. The, there's a link there um, to the manual. You've also got the PDF. I would recommend updating the tables in the top manual with what's in the farm water quality and treatment. That's a really good general reference and it covers off on not just salinity and sodicity, but hardness, um, you know, a whole range of things, iron, pH, things like that. If you're looking to work out how much gypsum you need to apply, that gypsum calculator of Greg Hams is a very good one. That's at James Cook University. Uh, the ANZAC guidelines, if you want some technical reading, and that salinity management handbook has been revised. Uh, and it's, it's a very good go-to little Bible. You've heard these points. Um, soil stability, organic matter cultivation, and the quality of your water. Leach your salts. Um, manage your dispersion with gypsum. Use your rainfall uh, strategically and your fresh water strategically. 
apply gypsum. And Abby, I think we're just about done. Fantastic. Thanks, Sam. Very pertinent, as I said, um, with uh, water scarcity in New South Wales and also really highlights the importance of managing um, to your individual system and the importance of monitoring. So uh, today's webinar is a little bit longer than we normally um, yes. have it. So we've got it. That's all right. We've got a few um, moments for questions. So uh, um, I've got one here from Clayton Richards. He said, thanks for the presentation. Have any of these studies used gypsum in different forms? So rock gypsum versus the recycled gyp rock material and any any comments on the effectiveness of those different materials? Um, yes, they have. I can't remember which one's off the top of my head. Um, the key bit of advice is that you need to check the quality of your gypsum. So if it's got impurities in it, then uh, bottom line, really don't use it. Uh, there are different impurities, one being sodium chloride, and you don't want to be putting sodium chloride on your paddocks. Um, and then the rest of it comes down to you know rock, what it ran down to fineness. And the, the bottom line there is that the finer it is, the more easier uh, to dissolve it will be. So it's a bit like a sugar hit. The coarser, you know, like the finer it is, the quicker it'll dissolve and the quicker the electrolyte effect, but the the um, shorter the duration, if that makes sense. So the coarser it is, uh, the longer it'll last, but it depends on what you want to use it for. So the main take home point there, yeah, get it analyzed for impurities. Um, Go for finer if you can. Um, do do, do again, we have numbers around that fineness? Because someone's asked about specifics around that as well. Yeah, I'm just, I do have some numbers that Ringer is the one that um, wrote on that. Not off the top of my head, probably is the easy answer to that one. I've, I've just found what I was looking for. Um, I'm reading now. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so that bit about impurities, cadmium, boron, sodium chloride. The recommendation is that if the gypsum contains more than 1% sodium chloride, don't use it. Your supplier yeah. should provide an analysis of your gypsum. Basically, the, the finer it is, the quicker it will dissolve. Um, and so that depends on your your use and how quickly you want to get it in there and the state mm. of your paddock at the time, I would think. A lot of this comes down to fact, like, like down to cost, I should say. The main thing is the impurities. It, gypsum, gypsum um, coarse or fine, it will work, um, but just make sure it hasn't, it's, it's got a it's good quality. Yep, okay. So there's just a quick question from Nick O'Halloran. He said, is the calculated LF an actual or a required LF? I guess that's from that table you're talking through. Yeah, um, the, it's calculated from the data that you collect and so it's an actual. The, okay. the two bits that Nick's talking about is leaching fraction, which is actual leaching requirement, which is done from a planning point of view as to what you might need in order to keep uh, root zone salinity below your crop threshold. Um, but again, with this management approach, we're wanting to actually get growers to do that soil sampling, um, measure the salinity at the bottom of their root zone, as well as the salinity of their applied waters so we can estimate what the actual leaching fraction is because it's a key indicator of whether that system's sustainable. We do need a leaching fraction. It's certainly more than 0.1. I've been conservative in saying 0.15. Um, the higher the salinity, the higher the leaching fraction. So yeah, that is required. So 0.15, you know, like most crops with irrigation water. And I, I wouldn't be recommending anyone using like more than, you know, 2.2, like 2 deci semen sort of water. The, the saltier it is, uh, or the less available fresh water is for leaching, the, the more cautious you should be about using higher salinity water because um, mm -hmm. it's that average salinity applied. 
So yeah, Nick, if you're still hearing me, it's it's an actual. Okay, thank you. And kind of following on from that, Yolanda um, has asked, what are the options of the low infiltration subsoils, so sodic subsoils? Um, the the long-term implications are that, you know, if you've got those sort of subsoils and you're not getting leaching, you're going to accumulate salts. Um, but in my experience here in the Riverina, like we've had subsoils, you saw that um, one of Brian Bridges, an ESP of 23, you've got ESPs of 30 to 35 in the subsoil and that Tatura experiment of um, Terry and Matt Bethunes and you're still getting leaching so you can you can manage them you have you know, that's the whole point i guess is to take a measure them monitor them and see mm. what's happening if you've got those tight subsoils and you're not getting any leaching well then i would cease irrigating them with groundwater uh, in general you'll find that if you're consistent with the quality of your water uh, those sort of soils will tend to open up. Um, our Western Murray soils well, had one irrigator come in at one stage. At normal rice water use is anywhere between say, 12 and 14 megalitres a hectare over a season with an aerial sown crop. And he was using 30 megalitres a hectare because he'd had you know, like about five to seven years of irrigating with groundwater and he'd opened up his soil that much. It was just behaving like a sand. So we might call it a day. I'll just take this opportunity, even though Sam's not here, to thank him uh, for presenting today and to thank you all uh, for attending and for those of you who've hung out right to the end. And we will hopefully see you next month. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. Remember, there are other channels that the New South Wales DPI curates for this community of interest around soils. We have a Twitter account and we publish a quarterly newsletter called All the Dirt. And if you'd like to check out either of these, you can do so using the links and the QR code that's on your screen now. And don't forget that you can subscribe to the webinars so that you don't miss out. You'll receive a monthly invitation and then you can choose whether you attend or not. And that link is also on your screen now. And if you've missed a webinar, you can easily catch up by viewing all our past webinars as recordings on the New South Wales DPI Ag YouTube channel or the unedited versions on the GoToStage channel. Thanks so much for supporting SNOC and we really look forward to seeing you online in the future.